Well, it's Aloha Sunday. Why Aloha Sunday? Ah, just for the heck of it. <laughs> but uh, as Carla touched on a little bit earlier at the beginning of the service, Aloha in the Hawaiian language, you know, after the TV show, especially Hawaii Five O in the 1960s, there's this assumption here on the mainland that Aloha is hello and goodbye, but it actually means a number of things, affection, peace, love, compassion, and mercy. And the Hawaiian language is, of course, a proto-Polynesian language, so it combines two words, alo and ha. And alo, in a lot of the Polynesian uh, islands, means presence, front, face, or share. And then ha means the breath of life, or the essence of life. You know, which is true in so many of the spiritual conditions, including, of course, Judaism and Christianity. Yahweh, the, uh, the name of God, the ancient Hebrews, was an inhalation and an exhalation. Yahweh. So, good morning. When many of us were growing up, we learned the uh, story of Chicken Little. Chicken Little was hopping around the farmyard and a huge oak tree near the farmyard dropped an acorn and bounced off the roof of the barn and landed in the tail feathers of Chicken Little. Now Chicken Little looked up at the blue sky and thought, the sky must be falling. So she realized this is an emergency and she needed to run and tell the king. She met Henny Penny along the way, and Henny Penny says, what's the hurry? She says, well, the sky is falling. And Henny Penny asks, why? How, how do you know that the sky is falling? She says, I saw it with my own eyes, I heard it with my own ears, and a piece of it fell on my tail. Well, that was good enough for Henny Penny, so they both started running towards the king, came upon Cocky Locky. Same sort of thing. Why? How did you know? I saw it with my own eyes, heard it with my own ears, and they come across Ducky Lucky, and then they come across Goosey Lucy. And Goosey Lucy, though, could run faster than any of them, so she rushed forward and came bursting in upon the king and said, Your Majesty, the sky is falling. Well, how do you know that the sky is falling, said the king. And Goosey Lucy said, Because Ducky Lucky told me. And he asked Ducky Lucky, Well, because? Cocky Locky told me, and because Henny Penny told me, <laughs> and Chicken Little told me. And finally, Chicken Little came forward and the king asked, well, how do you know the sky is falling? Well, I saw it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears and a piece of it fell on my tail. And the king came walking up to Chicken Little and reached into her tail feathers and pulled out an acorn. Said, ah, you see, the sky wasn't falling, an acorn simply fell on your tail. It's a children's story, but how many of us have fallen for the same assumptions? We assume. We filter things through our past experiences, or perhaps since, uh, you know, just... And it's, it's astounding, you know, how many people have made assumptions that aren't working. Now, we're reading and discussing the book, The Four Agreements. Last week we covered the first two. We have some small uh, group book groups discussing it, but we also have individuals you know, reading the book along, along with us. Um, we're doing it over like four or five weeks in the groups, but I decided to cover the first two last week and the third and the fourth this week to kind of give everybody a heads up as to what's coming. Uh, so let's take a look at the four agreements. Number one is to be impeccable with your word. Number two is never take anything personally. Number three is don't make assumptions. And number four is to do the, the best that you can. Now, these four agreements came from uh, the Toltecs in Mexico, as I mentioned last week. Uh, they were a, considered like a tribe of priests in ancient Mexico from about 3,000 years ago. And they found that these are the steps to live a joy-filled and peaceful life. And yet they felt that at the time the human race consciousness was a little too savage, so they kept it through the years until they felt that the society as a whole could accept it. 
when the author published this book in 1997, a descendant of those ancient people. But as I mentioned last week, it's, while it's a touching story, it's common to many of the spiritual traditions. You know, in our own Christian tradition, you know, we've got the, the Knights Templar and the Masons and all that have carried forward the esoteric truths of spirituality, uh, which often were you know, counter to what mainline Christianity was teaching. So let's uh, quickly, quickly review the first two. Number one is to be impeccable with your word. Never underestimate the power of your spoken word. We can use and abuse that power that we have. And the author writes, never underestimate, well, I'm sorry, the author writes, the word is not just a sound or a written symbol. The word is a force. It is the power you have to express and communicate, to think and thereby to create the events in your life. You can speak. What other animal on the planet can speak? The word is the most powerful tool you have as a human being. It is a tool of magic, but like a sword, it has two edges. Your word can create the most beautiful dream, or your word can destroy everything around you. Number two is never take anything personally. That is the default mode simply because we view the world and events through our own perspective, our five or perhaps six senses. So as we go through the world, we try to figure out how it affects us. But if we can let go of that, recognize that things shouldn't be taken personally. In fact, we would be very disappointed to find out that other people think of us very little. <laughs> but uh, so not taking things personally is an effect. And you'll notice that all four of these kind of build on each other and overlap. So let's move on to number three for this week. And I ask uh, Jesse to put up the next slide. I know back in the 1960s when I was a kid, I heard that when we assume, we make an ass of you and me. Years ago at a Unity Center in the Midwest, they had an Easter celebration. And uh, this particular center actually had some nice grassy areas out around the church. And so they, you know, some of the volunteers put together the plastic Easter eggs and put candy and, you know, and toys and stuff in them. And of course, you know, spread them out all over the lawn. And then, of course, the kids from Sunday school could, you know, go out there and, and find the eggs. And the woman who, who decorated for the, for the Easter occasion came up with some very nice silk flower arrangements in some flower pots. But it was a little windy that day, so she realized, okay, well, I've got the Easter grass and stuff in these flower pots, but I need to weight them down with something. So she came up with the idea, I'll just take some of these plastic eggs and I'll put some heavy rocks in them. And she put them inside the pots out there. Well, at the end of the day, she noticed that the pots had blown over and that the eggs were gone. And, <laughs> and they started thinking, oh, no. You know, imagine, you know, there's, there, there's a kid or at least one kid out there somewhere who's opening up an egg and finding rocks in it. You know, what, are the, you know, what will the people assume? Is, you know, is this some sort of a mean trick on these children? Or, or, or will the will parents turn it around on the children and say, ah, you see, I told you, if you don't behave, Santa Claus gives you coal in your stocking and the Easter Bunny gives you rocks in your eggs. And so they fretted a little bit about that, but uh, they mentioned it, you know, the next week, just to let people know, what, you know what had happened. And after, after the service, a woman came up to the minister and said, my daughter open those eggs with the rocks in them. And she goes, oh, I'm so sorry. She goes, no, no, it was perfect. She has a rock collection. She thought that these eggs were, per were personally de delivered to her. So you see how we can, it's, it wasn't interesting that the church leadership was, oh no, this is awful. <laughs> in reality, it turned out to be a wonderful gift. As we talk about in, in unity, divine order, the proper sequence of events leading to the highest good. Okay, and now you'll notice, as I mentioned before, that these four do build on each other. And of course, when we assume that someone else is going to behave in a particular way and then they don't, we take it personally. Minds are meaning-making machines. So when things happen, we search that database of our mind to try to, to, try to explain it somehow. You know, I, 
and I don't know if you've had this experience, I've had it a number of times where it's, maybe it's dark out and all of a sudden you see something in the distance and you're looking at it and you, and you can't figure out what it is. You know, maybe, maybe you have to get a flashlight and all, then all of a sudden you'll see, oh, it's just, you know, an overturned rake in the lawn or something like that. Uh, you know, until we, until we can make sense of it compared to our previous experience, uh, it, it's, a, it's a mystery to us. But if we're honest with ourselves, there's no way we can go through life without making some assumptions. You all are assuming that the chairs you're sitting in will support your weight for the amount of time that you're sitting in the chair. We assume that the sun will rise in the east and set in the west. But it's interesting how it rises and sets in a different spot along the horizon, depending upon what time of the year it is. And even the sun can be eclipsed by the moon occasionally. So, there's, it's okay to assume certain things, but here again, sometimes we can get, get caught in a box of thinking, and of course, as the, as the saying goes, we need to think outside the box. Uh, there was a couple who met in midlife and got married, and um, the woman wanted to make sure she prepared a nice meal for her new husband, and uh, so she, she was always used to eating at 6.30, but it ends up he was in a profession that needed a little bit more fluidity to his schedule, but early on, he wouldn't let her know <laughs> that, he was, that he wasn't coming home at 6.30 because he didn't know he was supposed to be. And this caused quite a bit of friction early on until they both kind of sat down and, okay, let's dig down to what our real need is. You know, and for her, it was like, well, she wanted to make sure that she was, you know, she was doing her part, playing her role, and then she thought that her role was to be able to cook him dinner every night. And he was like, well, you know, because of my profession and stuff, though, sometimes I'm going to, need to be in meetings and stuff until like 9 o'clock. And so once they had the meeting of the minds, they were able to come up with a certain flexibility to that. He could call her ahead of time if he knew that he'd be working late enough that he wouldn't be home until 6.30. It is so important for us to recognize when we are frustrated, what is at the very root of the need that we have? And when we can get honest about that, then we can figure out, can we meet those needs or can we find some ways that those needs will be met? Then we don't have to be frustrated or resentful. And let's not assume, assume that we know what each other is thinking or feeling. I know unity, of course, attracts people who are intuitive feelers. So a lot of times we get a sense of what a person is thinking and feeling, but it's always a good idea to ask a question. Number four is do the best that you can. A lot of you are familiar with the late Reverend Eric Butterworth. Uh, finished his ministerial career that, at the huge congregation in New York City. Um, he, he had he, one of his favorite uh, examples was when someone would come up to him and says, well, you know, if I were you, I would do this. And Eric said, I would respond, no, you wouldn't. If you were me, you'd be doing exactly the same thing I'm doing. Because you'd be thinking the way that I'm thinking. You'd be seeing the world the way I'm seeing it. Over my lifetime, I have really struggled with this one because I'm a recovering perfectionist. So when I heard, always do your best, I thought it meant always be perfect. The challenge was, for the first 30 years of my life, I had never really clearly defined what perfect was. I just knew I was in a constant state of disappointing others. And once I recognized that it, there was kind of this so kind of cloudy idea that I had to work 12 hours a day, at least six days a week, and be productive for all of those hours, that I started realizing the ridiculousness of that expectation on myself. As I've shared before, I rec each week there are about 80 things that I probably should do as your minister. And I've gotten to the point where I can celebrate if I accomplish 20 of them. And then, of course, each week I have to kind of reset things and look at the priorities for the week. And there have been times where I'll say to someone, oh, I'll make sure I get that to you. And I find I have to set deadlines for myself, you know. So there have been times where someone had to wait a few months before, me, before I could get something to them uh, because I knew they didn't need it right away. Uh, but the truth is that we always do the best that we can under the circumstances. A young uh, working woman uh, was preparing for her son's seventh birthday. And she wanted to make it special, as all mothers do. And she, her son was just fascinated with firehouses and firefighters. 
And through a friend of a friend, she was able to arrange for him and five of his good friends to visit a firehouse and spend the afternoon with some firefighters, just kind of going through the routine and learning what it is that they do and how they do it. And then they were going to do a you know, big celebration at McDonald's afterwards, but she wanted to get them a very nice birthday cake. So she stopped by this little bakery that she heard you know, had a real good reputation in their neighborhood. And she described, you know, I want to get a birthday cake, but could you decorate it you know, in this firehouse theme? And she explained what they were going to be doing. And the woman said, well, I'm really not sure, but, uh, you know, and she said, well, that's okay, just do the best that you can. And <laughs> so the next day, uh, she comes in to pick up the cake. The frosting was an artistic masterpiece. She said there was a firehouse, incredibly detailed. There was a fire truck, hoses coiled and uncoiled, laying out on the ground, a Dalmatian. A firefighter sitting in the front seat of the fire truck, door open. Another fireman on the back of the truck, waving. Even a fire hydrant in front. And she just took her breath away. She said, oh my God, look at this cake. And then she started to think, oh boy, am I going to be charged extra for this? And uh, the woman says, well, how much do I owe you? And she says, well, just the standard rate that she'd given yesterday. But this is amazing. How did this say? Please give my compliments to the baker. And she says, well, so actually last night our ninth baker had a very low workload. Um, it was just that we didn't have as many orders. So he had like about four hours to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, he, so he did the best that he could with the time that he had. And that's a good point in recognizing that the best that we can do often depends upon other circumstances. Like the amount of time that we have to do something. You know, we'll do the best that we can do within the time frame. There's also our mood. The psychologist Joseph Bailey uh, writes, have you ever noticed that when you wake up in a lousy mood and you move around the world that people are just much more irritating on that day? Another thing that can affect it is our health. You know, if, we, you know, if we're socked by the bad case of the flu or the cold, I mean, you know, our priorities come just <laughs> in being face down in the bed and sleeping for some extra hours of the day. And then, of course, new information arriving. You know, we can be cruising along, but then suddenly the new information comes and it changes our whole way of thinking. There was a man who used to enjoy uh, operating his ham radio, you know, an amateur radio, on Saturday mornings. And he was uh, working his way over to the frequency that uh, to listen to a particular uh, show that he liked to listen to, but all of a sudden he comes across this voice that just made him stop. And the man was apparently just talking to one other man, and uh, the man was saying this. Said, when I was 55 years old, I realized that I needed to take some time to really smell the roses and recognize that I needed to do the best that I could and to recognize the blessing that I have that I'm alive. It says, I, he, I sat down and realized, okay, how many Saturdays have I lived? And he calculated that he, that he lived 2,860 Saturdays or weeks. And so he said, well, how many Saturdays do I have until I'm 75 years old? And he calculated 1,040 Saturdays. And he said, well, on that day I purchased a large, clear jar, and it took me going to a few toy stores, but I was able to purchase 1,040 marbles. And I filled that jar with all of those marbles. And every Saturday, I would look at that jar and I'd take one of the marbles out and open my heart in gratitude for the blessing that I had been given of another week on this earth. And it would kind of set the tone for me to really appreciate the people in my life, my loved ones. He says, and I would take that marble with me and, so, and that day I would give it to someone, usually a child, as just a gift. It reminded me to just do my best under, my, under the circumstances. He says, today is my 75th birthday and I'm looking at the last marble. The jar is now empty. He says, so today I've just made a decision that I'm going to go out and buy another 1,040 marbles. <laughs> but this time, rather than 
putting them all in the jar at once, I'm going to start taking them from a bin and putting them in the jar. And that'll be my reminder once again for being grateful for every day that I have. Well, here the guy who had been working his way across the ham radio caught that, looked at it as being a message, and he started to really think about it. Wow, yeah. I mean, do I really take time to express gratitude and, and appreciation for the people in my life? And here he had uh, had this morning planned out, and he realized he was going to just chuck that whole schedule. And he went and, and kissed his wife awake and told her, let's, you know, let's go up and do something special together. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, finish each day and be done with it. You have done what you could. Some blunders, some absurdities have crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it serenely and with too high a spirit to be encumbered by your old nonsense. So, as a recovering perfectionist, I realized that I did my best. I may have made mistakes, but hey, we all make mistakes. I just need to be use that wonderful spiritual tool of forgiveness. Forgiving myself for the mistakes I made. But also forgiving other people who who got in the way of the day unfolding according to my preferences. The Gospel of Mark, third chapter, twenty eighth verse. Jesus is telling the people, Truly I say to you, whatever whatever blasphemies we utter, and all sins will be forgiven for all human beings. That's funny. I've never heard that in a fundamentalist church. But here it is. Jesus, truly I say to you, whatever blasphemies we utter, and all sins will be forgiven of all human beings. So let's do a quick review of the four principles. And like I said, we've got this book available in the book and gift shop. So if you're not part of a group, you might want to just pick up the book. It's an easy read, and that's why we chose it for, for light reading over the summer. Number one is be impeccable with your word. Number two is to never take anything personally. <laughs> Shortly after Booker T. Washington uh, took the leadership of the Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama in 1881, uh, he was walking through town, and he was walking near the home of a wealthy family. And, and a woman came running out and looked at him and said, I need you to chop up some wood, and showed him the wood pile, and bring it into the kitchen. And Booker T. Washington said, okay. <laughs> and he went over and chopped up the wood and brought it into the kitchen, and there were some servants in there who recognized him. He said, Mr. Washington, what are you doing? He says, well, the lady of the house asked me to chop up some wood and bring it into the kitchen, so here it is. And then he went on his way. And when the lady of the house came back to the kitchen, the servants are telling her who that was. The next morning, in his office, the woman was there and apologizing to him. I'm so sorry, sir. I just assumed you were one of our hired hands. I didn't know who you were. And uh, Booker T. Washington said, It's quite all right, man. I like to work, and I like doing favors for my friends. The woman was so touched and so impressed by his attitude that she started regularly making contributions to the Tuskegee Institute, which is now Tuskegee University. And she also became a fundraiser for them, encouraging other people to give to the Tuskegee Institute. So never take anything personally. And you can be amazed sometimes at, at what rewards it would reap. Number three, don't make assumptions. And when we do make assumptions, let's assume the highest and the best in all, in all matters. And number four is do the best that you can. Now, earlier I mentioned the psychologist Joseph Bailey. He's the president of the Minneapolis, or I guess he was the president of the Minneapolis Institute of Mental Health. And in his book, The Serenity Principle, he wrote this, the past is no longer real. It was very real when it happened, regardless of how pleasant or unpleasant the experience. They were very real at the time, but they are not real now. 
everyone and everything connected with an incident that we are holding on to from the past, either good or bad, has changed. In today's reality, the past is non-existent. We can keep things real in our minds if we choose to, but we don't have to. We can let them go because they have no reality of their own, no power, no influence, except that which we give them. Our closing story tonight is a two-minute video from Steve Hartman of the CBS Evening News of a man who I feel embodies all four of these agreements. Being a custodian here at Trinity High School in Euless, Texas isn't exactly the most important job in America. But don't tell that, you all do that trash. to the custodian. If I clean a toilet and you sit on that toilet, you can rest assured that's the cleanest toilet you will ever sit on. I'll take your word for that. Yeah. <laughs> Charles Clark takes his job that seriously. But his greatest asset has nothing to do with his cleaning. It's his counseling. We sit on this rock right here. Not long after he started at Trinity 25 years ago, Charles Clark began pulling kids aside. Y'all anxious for to find out who our new coach gonna be? Kids he thought might be falling through the cracks. I'm not asking you to be a role scholar. Kids he thought might need a little mentoring. Before you get in trouble, you're gonna call me, right? Kids like 17-year-old Jesse Walewa. Right there. Mr. Clark's been looking out for me ever since I've been here. I can tell Mr. Clark anything. I know he's gonna give me his honest opinion. He's very wise. Very loving. I'm going to talk to you. They have never had a man tell them they love them before. Once they trust you and they know you love them, you can get them to buy into what you're selling. What does the school counselor think of you? Oh, they get most of my clients come from the counselors. <laughs> really? That's very true. Peggy McIntyre is a clinical counselor at Trinity with a master's in social work. But she says Charles has a better way with certain kids. He's worked with a lot of our students here who ended up going to college, who ended up doing really well. So he gets results. He gets results. He sure does. He sure does. Now you don't want to wait till your senior year. By all accounts, this custodian has helped dozens of kids turn their lives around. Not because it was his job, but because it needed to be done. I'm proud of you as a young man. And there's a lesson in there for anyone who feels trapped <laughs> by their title. Hey, now how you doing? You won't tell me I don't have a good life. This custodial thing is working good for me. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road in Euless, Texas. I got a great life. <laughs> From the book of Job, 27th chapter, starting with the third verse. As long as my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood, my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. And may you always be open to God's guidance and grace.
please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. Ready. 